Greetings. Applying physiology before pharmacology for restorative sleep and better moods. I'm Dr. Russell Jaffe. I maintain a fellow status as a clinical pathologist. I'm a fellow of the American College of Nutrition, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, the Federation of Clinical Immunology Societies, the Federation of a Medical Laboratory Immunologist, and I'm an overseas fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm a senior fellow and helped found the Health Studies Collegium to do holistic systems biology and integrative studies. And I'm founder and chairman of Perk Integrative Health, ELISA Act Biotechnologies, and RMJHRX. So I did my internal medicine training and biochemistry training at Boston University. I helped found the Certified Clinical Nutrition Program and had the privilege of serving as their education director for the first eight years of its organizational life. You can reach me in many ways, including online uh, or by email at rjaffe at, hs, at 4hsc.org. That's r-j-a-f-f-e at the number four, then hsc.org. Now, achieving restorative sleep and enhanced mood using physiology before pharmacology. Most of us understand that sleep is more than the absence of being awake, that sleep is really important for healthy physiology, for the rhythms that control our brain and mood, the so-called HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which has to do with endocrine and hormonal balance or imbalance. And while during the day we're on defense alert, during the night, we should restore and repair. We should help remove toxins from the body and help stabilize the depth and quality of our sleep and moods using essential nutrients based on individual biochemical needs. So this is a lifestyle program, and I'd like to share with you some of what I've learned and that I practice. and. The, and I'm happy to share with you that my loved ones and, and those who have followed these recommendations have found them to be practical, helpful, and timely. So what is this lack of restorative sleep? Well, first, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you see about 60 million Americans suffer from sleep-related issues. That's about one in five. And this was in 2006, and today it probably would be substantially higher. When we don't get quality sleep, when we don't get restorative sleep, we have impaired resilience, we have lower endurance, our productivity, our output is reduced, our immune defense and repair system is suppressed at the very time when it should be repairing us and eliminating abnormal cells. And if you have any concerns about memory problems, restorative sleep is one of the most important pieces of maintaining a healthy memory and improving your memory uh, if you don't get current restorative sleep. And then there are the heart-related issues, from nocturnal hypertension to irregular heartbeats like atrial fibrillation, and then the hyperphagia, that is, when many people begin to process the day, their gut reacts and their inclination is to go and feed themselves, go and eat something, when in fact they should be something rather than eat something. So lack of restorative sleep, very common. We don't need to labor that. It is a, somewhat a function of your age or the season of your life, as I prefer to see it. So yes, infants sleep longer, toddlers a little less, but easily half of the day. In school, generally as we get our young adult lives often need less sleep or we give ourselves less sleep because many young people and young adults are chronically sleep deprived. And while what you see on the slide is a mean and a usual range, I can tell you that there are some adults who need 10 to 11 hours of restorative sleep and they do well and others need six or less and they do just fine. We'll talk about why that is, but it's important to know that at different seasons of a life, you may very well have a different kind of sleep uh, quality uh, and duration uh, that's needed. 
And with that, the habits of restful sleep become more important. So let's look at some of the, act, uh, some of the functions of sleep. Um, perhaps you're aware that growth hormone, that very important hormone known as growth hormone, comes out in two very brief pulses at the end of the first two sleep cycles. That is about two-thirds of your whole day's growth hormone will be released at the end of the first sleep cycle and about a third more at the end of the second sleep cycle. And so it's very important to get at least two or three deep restorative sleep cycles, each of which is about 90 minutes. More is helpful and some people need longer, some people lesser. Uh, what's important uh, is that it be deep and the usual stages of sleep all be present. And this is one of the dilemmas with many of the medications, because on the one hand, you are hypnagogic, that is, you're asleep, but you're not getting the benefit of the deep uh, stage four sleep cycle and the healthy hormones that are released uh, at that critical time. Along with growth hormone, a number of other pituitary hormones come out, including prolactin, LH, which is luteinizing hormone, oxytocin, the hormone of touch, um, and so do thyroid and adrenal relating, stimulating or releasing factors. So from the thyroid uh, gets instructions from pituitary TSH, adrenal gets instructions from pituitary ACTH, and in the best of cases, the free T3, free T4, plus or minus reverse T3 are all in the healthier range. And in regard to adrenals and ACTH, uh, you want the cortisol and DHEA balance at four different time points uh, to be in balance. Uh, and when one is up and the other is down, or when both are down, there are adverse consequences that distress the sleep and produce lack of restorative sleep because of the sleep disturbances. You probably have heard the term circadian rhythms. These are time-related rhythms, circadian rhythms in sleep. And here we see a look at the adrenal hormones. Your cortisol, the black line, should rise just as you're getting up. It should peak in the late morning, and it should come down in the evening. Melatonin, in contrast, the red line, should come down in the morning and increase in the evening as part of getting you ready for restorative sleep. So we want to look at the cortisol DHEA ratios. We can look at that in saliva or in plasma. We might want to look at the adrenaline to serotonin levels. There we could look in the platelets or we could look in the 24-hour urine uh, to look at the neurotransmitters and their metabolites uh, and then uh, determine which come from the gut nervous system, which come from the central nervous system, and we have specialized uh, uh, information for those of you who are interested in that side of our work. So in regard to circadian rhythms and these time-dependent cycles and sleep, a rise in serotonin, which is then converted to melatonin, and a concurrent fall in cortisol and adrenaline is required in order to transition into sleep. Let me say the same thing another way. Only when serotonin rises and adrenaline falls in the sleep center of the brain, does a person fall asleep? Well, what if you don't have enough tryptophan to make serotonin so the serotonin doesn't rise? What if you have so much tyrosine and so much hypervigilance that the adrenaline doesn't fall? So there are people who have been studied in hospitals and in medical centers who have gone without sleep for extended period of time. And in almost all cases, it was an imbalance in their tryptophan, serotonin, melatonin, tyrosine, adrenaline, cortisol relationships. So yes, these stress hormones are really important and being stress resilient is really important. But in order to actually go from wake to sleep, serotonin must rise and adrenaline must fall in the sleep center of the brain. So how do we make that happen more effectively? 
Well, first, let's look a little bit at low adrenal function and why that's so important, uh, and then look at what we can do uh, to help ourselves have restorative sleep. When we have low adrenal function, which is also known as Addison's syndrome for Professor Addison, who studied it many decades ago, you have a lack of energy, your get up and go has gotten up and went and you can't find it. Um, low adrenal function is related to over 80% of the stress-related reasons that people seek out medical care. One of the consequences of low adrenal function is a lack of restorative sleep and usually rather uncontrollable urges to eat, moods that tend to swing back and forth, and brains that tend to be foggy. So we want to have that not. We have pioneered adaptogenic adrenal support. And this involves using a very special form of rhodiola, the rosea callus, and the rhizomes very specifically. Because there is scientific evidence that rhodiola, especially when it's mycelized in a soft gel, decreases depression, reduces fatigue, helps moods be more stable and regular, improves restorative sleep rhythms, improves irritability, uh, reduces uh, headaches, and improves people's concentration. And you see on the bottom of the slide some scientific references that support uh, the work, uh, that report the work uh, in support of these approaches. Now we combine this to achieve synergistic adrenal adaptogenic support by using magnolia and philodendron, philodendron extracts. The magnolia officinalis is a tree native to rainforests in China and Asia, and the bark has long been used for stress and anxiety control um, uh, in their cultural uh, pharmacopoeia. Now, magnolia and philodendron work together by binding to stress hormone receptors in the nervous system and quieting both the gut and the central nervous system. So this supports or restores levels of cortisol. So the cortisol to DHEA rhythms, circadian rhythms and others are restored. It promotes relaxation and feelings of well-being. It promotes the sense that things are okay as opposed to a sense of impending doom. It is not sedative in contrast to most other kinds of and other categories of such products. And it reduces stress-related eating uh, so it can help people keep a healthier weight. Now, we've mycelized these adaptogenic adrenal support components in perilla oil. This enhances uptake and helps chaperone delivery. We include MCT, medium-chain triglycerides, uh, basically from raw organic coconut. This, and then we mycelize all of these ingredients uh, to enhance their uptake and to chaperone their delivery where needed. Perilla oil is rich in omega-3 fatty acids, and it helps enhance immune system repair. And MCTs, medium-chain triglycerides, reduce cell acid. They alkalinize. They're the healthy fats that help us uh, be more alkaline. They're not the long-chain fats, the saturated long-chain fats that acidify us. So we want the good, healthy MCT um, because it helps assimilate and metabolize these components. Now, what is 21st century adrenal balance? When we have healthy adrenal hormone balance, we have a kind of relief from the stress of high-tech living. It helps us avoid that afternoon crash. There's so many people that tell me they have to get everything done that's important to them in the morning because after lunch, they're just not productive much at all. And when we have good adrenal balance, then we get repair stimulated by the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, in its normal rhythmic fashion. We don't force it, we encourage it. And healthy adrenal balance means getting restorative sleep that improves a sustainable energy level with, so that we don't suffer from energy dropouts. It combats food cravings and uncontrollable binges and helps rebuild immune defense and repair tolerance and resilience. 
So cortisol to DHEA rhythm changes for healthier balance are very important, and restorative sleep helps, helps people achieve this. Now, in regard to the sleep cycle, let's focus on that amino acid tryptophan that comes from our diet. It can come from meat. Uh, it can come from several different sources, including certain nuts and seeds. And it effectively is converted, tryptophan is converted to serotonin, which is then acetylated and converted to melatonin in the pineal. So the pineal is really the master of the master gland, and that's where the amino acid tryptophan has to get. So it comes in through the gut, has to get across the blood-brain barrier, it has to get into these specialized uh, sites related to control of sleep in the brain, and then the tryptophan locally is converted to serotonin, acetylated, and then converted to melatonin in the sequence you can see. And yes, 5-HTP is, is in between tryptophan and serotonin, um, and it does uh, help with satiety, uh, but we'll talk about why you want tryptophan and why you don't want to replace tryptophan with 5-HTP. So let's talk about the serotonin-melatonin deficiency state, or shall I say the folks who have difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, and often wake up too early without feeling rested. So the fancy way of saying that is the serotonin-melatonin deficiency state. And melatonin synthesis decreases in the pineal gland when essential cofactors are depleted. So in order to convert the essential amino acid tryptophan to serotonin and serotonin to melatonin, you have to have an energetic cell with a mitochondria that is able to produce ATP. You have to have enough magnesium to keep that mitochondria functioning, the so-called proton uh, balance, the proton gradient of Mitchell. Uh, and you must have enough antioxidants, like ascorbate, to donate the electrons uh, that make these reactions happen. So healthy people have this automatically, and many people need to balance the intake of essential amino acids and then the cofactors, the B vitamins, the ascorbate and other antioxidants, uh, the CoQ10 and essential cofactors that help convert the tryptophan to serotonin, serotonin to melatonin, where you need it and when you need it. And a very important point, the body makes and uses melatonin within minutes. It never floods the whole body with melatonin because it's such a powerful methylating agent that it can over-methylate people. It produces and uses melatonin as a methylating agent locally where needed and when needed. How remarkable of the body. Now, what about the tryptophan story? Because you may have heard that back when, in the late 1980s, about 1989, uh, a manufacturer inadvertently contaminated their tryptophan by changing methods. It was from one specific Japanese source. And that tryptophan, that um, modified tryptophan, induced eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, EMS, eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. And FDA, out of an excess of caution, uh, asked the uh, industry uh, to avoid tryptophan until 2005, even though it was published early on that pure L-tryptophan did not cause the problems. The problem was that the manufacture change led to a contaminant that induced the EMS or the eosinophilia and the myalgia. Eosinophilia means that eosinophils or allergic cells in the blood uh, went up dramatically, and myalgia means that the muscles hurt in those people. Um, now, tryptophan is an essential amino acid. Tryptophan is converted in the body to serotonin and then to melatonin, as we spoke about a few minutes ago. Tryptophan stabilizes certain circadian rhythms, so it's an essential amino acid. We have to take it in from the outside. The body can't make it on its own. Tryptophan improves relaxation and mood balance, and it increases delta wave deep sleep. Remember I mentioned that at the end of the fourth cycle of sleep, there's a deep phase during which growth hormone and other hormones are released, and this is known as the delta wave deep sleep. Uh, moment. 
Tryptophan is especially helpful because it does not cause grogginess or brain fog upon waking. Many sleep aids leave people foggy and with a lack of the restorative sleep that they need. Tryptophan, on the other hand, is your friend. It's the physiologic answer, and many people don't get enough tryptophan in their diet. Their gut is metabolizing the tryptophan that they take in, and so supplements taken a half an hour before sleep uh, of 500 to 1,000 milligrams of tryptophan with some B vitamins to enhance the uptake is what we recommend. So if we look at this together, we can look at tryptophan and we can look at 5-HTP. We see the tryptophan is the starting substrate. It is the amino acid from which the body makes 5-HTP and then serotonin, it needs to cross the blood-brain barrier, as does 5-HTP. Tryptophan, on the other hand, has alternate pathways that it nourishes, and the body selects how much tryptophan goes towards NAD, to niacin, 5-HTP, whereas 5-HTP only goes to serotonin and then can go to quinolinic acid, which is an excitoneurotoxin, something you don't want. In terms of absorption, tryptophan uh, is uh, taken on an empty stomach because it's an amino acid, take it on rising in uh, half an hour before bed, and its uptake is enhanced with B6, with zinc, and a little bit of B3. 5-HTP, on the other hand, does have rapid and easy uptake, but because it metabolizes to the quinolinic acid excitoneurotoxins, I avoid it. So for long-term use, tryptophan is safer, healthier, and has results uh, that have sustained over decades. 5-HTP has limited uh, support. In regard to drug interactions, tryptophan, because of the diversity that it can go either towards serotonin or towards NAD or towards niacin, has very few drug interactions, whereas there are more with 5-HTP. So detoxification and sleep are interrelated. In a sense, sleep helps cleanse the brain. As you see on the left, a good night's rest literally clears the mind. However, as you see on the right, presence of toxins affects the normal hormonal cycle necessary for restorative sleep. So what are we to do? Well, we've also put together uh, a set of amino acids, simple amino acids, uh, that when taken together, improve both mood and sleep. And this starts with methionine. Methionine reduces excitoneurotoxins. It makes the mind less jumpy. It makes the mind better able to relax into and get deep restorative sleep. And it reduces depression and anxiety. It's really preferred over SAMe, which is S-adenosyl methionine. First of all, it's less expensive. Second of all, the s methionine has to be de-adenosylated back to methionine. So we recommend the physiologic first approach using L-methionine. Uh, it's also less expensive, more stable, and more functional. And then we combine this with gly glycine. Glycine enables more restful sleep. It supports healthy serotonin levels. It helps normalize circadian rhythms, it decreases fatigue, it improves mental clarity. And while you may know it as a simple amino acid that can be used uh, for energy when necessary, glycine is also in the gut and in the central nervous system a stabilizing, helpful neurochemical. And glutamine, which helps repair the gut, we recommend it always be recycled. When you use recycled glutamine, You've reduced stress, you reduce mood swings and anxiety, you increase GABA, which is helpful both in the gut nervous system and in the brain. And when you recycle the glutamine, you never build up glutamate as an excitoneurotoxin. Now, is the emphasis we place on functional detoxification really clearly evidence-based? We think yes, and here's just an example that comes from the Department of Health and Human Services. If you compare over just 100 years, which in, in medical and evolutionary terms is a tiny change in time, 
the industrial chemicals have increased more than 15 fold. That's 1500% to be technical. They're found in all pregnant women exposed and many, the average when studied was 43 of these xenotoxins could be found in the cord blood uh, at the time these women were delivering babies. So yes, the environment that we marinate in is full of toxins. And yes, we need to enhance our body's ability, our body's ability to get these toxins out. And with our physiology before pharmacology, with our physiology first approach, we want to introduce you first to the bio detox superfoods. There are five foods that in different cultures have been found to be particularly helpful uh, and health promoting. There's an acronym, which is GGOBE, and that stands for garlic, which you see on the left, then ginger, then in the middle onions, then broccoli sprouts, and on the far right, eggs. So GGOBE will help you remember that one or more of these needs to be a staple in your diet. A whole bulb of garlic roasted can be a delicious custard-like uh, condiment uh, and staple uh, contribution to your diet. A thumb-sized piece of ginger cooked into whatever you're having as your main course or uh, shredded onto fruit for dessert uh, is a wonderful way of increasing the savoriness while also protecting uh, your body's detoxification capacity. Um, a red onion a day, or at least an onion a day. Sprouts, as much as you want. Sprouts is one of those foods that you can have ad lib. And eggs, now I prefer duck or goose eggs, or a truly free-range chicken egg, and what do these five very different foods have in common? They're all rich in sulfur. They all contain sulforaphane, IP6, and are rich in minerals. And our contribution has been to add PAC, pyridoxal alpha ketoglutarate, to recycle the glutamine on average 10 times. So we suggest that a gram and a half of glutamine recycled by PAC gives you the repair an energy capacity equal to 15 grams of free glutamine in the studies that were done at Harvard. And so we recommend a gram and a half of glutamine recycled with pack on rising, half an hour before bed. And if you exercise, you will improve your stamina and in enhance your recovery time uh, if you add a dose of a gram and a half of the glutamine recycled with pack. Uh, 30 minutes before exercise. Nature gives us many synergistic and helpful essential uh, components, and one of these is magnesium, which is nature's stress buster. It's nature's calcium channel blocker. It helps regulate that HPA access. It helps reduce excessive ACTH. It helps improve the cortisol to DHEA balance or ratio, and less stress hormones come across the blood-brain barrier when people have enough magnesium. Magnesium, in essence, says, ah, at the time when calcium says, let's go. Magnesium reduces systemic inflammation, it enhances repair within the immune system, and it protects the brain from depression and mood swings. Now, we have pioneered and urge you to have the enhanced uptake and chaperone delivery magnesium with choline citrate. So you take two capsules of magnesium uh, citrate uh, with a teaspoon of choline citrate. Uh, you get 220 milligrams per dose. You do that one to four times a day, maybe up to 880 milligrams per day of elemental magnesium, which everyone knows is a lot. And absent the enhanced uptake that the choline citrate provides, uh, you would likely run to the bathroom. So magnesium does many things, including it displaces toxic minerals, it protects fats in transit, uh, it is the mineral along with zinc that's on metallothionine, the body's sponge to soak up toxic metals, and when we have enough magnesium, 
the body rather easily makes metallothionine, especially if we have the GGOBE sulfur-rich foods in our diet. Now, the choline and the citrate are important because the choline is converted to acetylcholine soothing neurotransmitter and to cholinergic bile salts, and the citrate energizes and uh, helps the whole cell metabolism uh, work more effectively. So in addition to GGOBE and magnesium with choline citrate, we want to introduce you to the fact that the body is speaking and we can listen more effectively to it. And one of the ways we can listen to our body is to check the urine pH just after rest. So when we have six or more hours of rest, the urine equilibrates with the lining cells in the bladder and the GU tract, and the next urine that comes out is a single meaningful measure of the body's cellular metabolic acidosis risk. And this is a Goldilocks story. If you use a high contrast pH paper with a range of five to eight, a healthy person will be green. This means they'll be in the six and a half to seven and a half pH range. If you're yellow, you're too acid. Below 6.5 is too acid. This means a lack of minerals like magnesium and too much acid inside the cell that tends to shut down the cellular battery. And if you're blue, if the strip is blue, you could have catabolic illness and be using uh, your amino acids uh, for energy and wasting ammonia into the urine. Uh, and we don't want catabolic illness. We don't want cellular metabolic acidosis. We want to be in the healthy 6.5 to 7.5 pH range, which means we're taking in enough magnesium uh, to keep us in that healthy 6.5 to 7.5 range. And that amount of magnesium is what protects us and helps displace toxic minerals. Uh, and so it does many, many things that uh, are in the body important for us to pay attention to. Fortunately, we now can do these rather simple self-assessments as part of our habits of daily living, and I recommend this to you, uh, and want to make mention of the gut-brain connection. Um, I've said several times that the central nervous system and the gut nervous system are in communion, they're in constant conversation, and so while there is a blood-brain barrier on the other side of which is the central nervous system, and the gut nervous system includes the digestive tract, but we're talking about the intestinal wall where the immune system, half of your immune system lines the intestinal wall. It's called the Peyer's patches. And when you uh, look at this slide on the left, you see that the gut and brain nervous systems communicate about motility, about secretion of things like secretory IgA, uh, and mucins and other protective, uh, elective protective elements. Um, this uh, also can help select for nutrient delivery and uptake and improve the microbial balance, the, the, the bugs in the gut. And by the way, there are about 10 times more bugs in the gut than we have cells in our body. So we really need to nourish the microbiome as well as the metabolome. Now, the gut nervous system and the central nervous system interact, as you see on the right, with influences on neurochemicals, neurotransmitters that have to do with stress, resilience, mood swings, and anxiety, and overall behavioral maturity. So, from the microbiome point of view, the essentials are to have enough healthy prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics. For prebiotics, it means 40 to 100 grams per day of fiber with an 80 to 20 soluble to insoluble ratio. So you want unprocessed prebiotic fibers in the amounts Dr. Dennis Burkett recommends. And the probiotic bugs, healthy bugs, we want 40 to 100 billion CFU or live bugs, CFUs for colony forming units, 40 to 100 billion healthy bugs a day, live in a dairy free medium. And we recommend 10 different strains because you need acidophilus regularly to nourish other microbiome bugs, but you also need bifidobacter and let them multiply in a healthy way in the gut because if you have enough healthy probiotic bugs coming in, you displace the pathogenic uh, uh, unhealthy bugs, uh, and uh, that's what we recommend. 
And then, because we need to repair the gut, we recommend symbiotics along with the prebiotics and the probiotics. The symbiotics are the recycled glutamine, the glutamine in pack. We want one and a half to six grams a day taken on rising before bed and the exercise. Restorative sleep is largely a choice. And here are some of my helpful hints <clears throat> using physiology first. Treat yourself to a salt and soda bath, 20 minutes in a warm tub of water with a half a cup each of Epsom salts and baking soda. The Epsom salts provides magnesium, the baking soda provides bicarbonate. This relaxes the piloerector muscles on your skin, it allows certain acid toxic wastes to be released into the alkaline bath, and some magnesium is taken up through your skin because it's an accessory organ of excretion and uptake. During the time you're in that salt and soda bath, you might do five minutes of abdominal breathing and 15 minutes of active visualization or mindfulness practice. And you might put a green dichromatic light because green dichromatic light helps soothe your pineal. It positively affects deep brain structures and chemical pathways. My suggestion is leave all electronics out of the bedroom. For example, in my bedroom, no phones, no screens, and, and no even clocks. My suggestion is to keep caffeine in the morning, if at all, as, as the same with eating your majority of calories before one o'clock in the afternoon and eating light in the evening. You can have all the salads and most of the berries that you want, but you go to sleep with as close to an empty, not full tummy as possible. And remember, supplemental tryptophan, especially in the form that we've discussed it, and enhanced uptake magnesium uh, are your friends, as is B6 and B complex, so that you can benefit from restorative sleep even in the 21st century. My name is Russ Jaffe. I'm pleased to bring you this information and challenge you to put yourself to the test as I have so that restorative sleep can be your friend and leave you feeling and functioning better now and for life.